And this obviously isn't going to be anything new. This isn't going to be anything deep. This is a very, very basic message. But it's the type of thing you can spend the rest of your life doing, and we'll never, we'll never completely do it. First Chronicles chapter 17, starting in verse 1. The Bible says, Now it came to pass, as David sat in his house, that David said to Nathan the prophet, Lo, I dwell in a house of cedars, but the ark of the covenant of the Lord remaineth under curtains. And then Nathan said to, said to David, Do all that is in thine heart, for God is with thee. And it came to pass the same night that the word of God came to Nathan, saying, Go and tell David my servant, Thus saith the Lord, Thou shalt not build me a house to dwell in. Let's go ahead and pray. Dear Lord, I just pray you would be with, be with me, Lord, as I preach, Lord. Lord, you know I'm nothing but just a man of unclean lips, Lord. And Father, I just pray that your Holy Spirit would just use me, Lord, to just preach the message the way you'd want it preached, to say everything you want me to say, nothing more, nothing less, and the way you want me to say it. And I just pray you get all the honor and glory out of it. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Now in this passage, of course, the background to it is God's given David great victory. God's given David great blessing. David's never lost a battle. He's gotten to slay the giant, he's, and he's now king over Israel. And David gets the idea, you know what, God's done so much for me, I want to do something great for him. And that's a very good desire. God commends him later on for it and says, you did well that it was in your heart. But David comes up with a great scheme. Everybody thinks it's a great idea. And then God says, no, you're not going to do that. And, I, and of course, that happens all. And of course, there's a couple different responses you can have. When God tells you no, there's a couple different responses you can have. You can first off, you can say, "Well, bless God, I'm going to do it anyway," and then you're going to get out of the will of God and possibly and spend a couple years out of His will, like Paul did by getting ahead of Him. You can also decide, "Well, if God's not going to let me do what I want to do, then I'm not going to do anything." Or else you can do like David did, which is what I'm going to preach on day. You're going to, you can just do what you can do. God may not let you do what you want to do. He may not let you do what you think you could do. But by the grace of God, you can, you're supposed to do what you can do. Look over at 1 Chronicles chapter 22, verse 5, over a couple pages. 1 Chronicles chapter 22, verse 5. The Bible says, And David said, Solomon, my son, is young and tender, and the house that is to be built for the Lord must be exceeding magnificent of fame and of glory. Throughout all countries, I will therefore now make preparation for it. So David prepared abundantly before his death. David decided, well, if I can't build this great house, if I can't do this great thing I want to do, well, then by the grace of God, I'm going to do everything I can over here. And that's what God needs today. Most people, I'm called to be a missionary, but most people that I preach to are not called to be missionaries. Most, I'm, I'm a preacher. Most people I preach to are not called to be preachers. But every single person is called to do what they can do. Because, every, because God has different wills, He has different desires, He has different things He wants each child of God to do. And lots of times Christians, you tend to get the idea of, well, this guy over here has got this great big church, he's preaching to a thousand people, that, he, that must mean he's extra close to God. No, not necessarily. He's supposed to be doing what God wants him to do. And, it, and God doesn't look at things the way we do. God doesn't look at some great event. Great event. I'm going to vent on this for a minute. This isn't in the message, but I'm going to vent on it because it annoyed me the other day. I was talking to this preacher. I was talking to this. I was talking to this preacher. Actually, at Dr. Edmund's funeral, at Dr. Edmund's funeral, this other preacher, and and I mean he's a, he's a, he's a nice guy, but he just said something really stupid. and He knew better too, which I didn't correct him on it. But I just thought, man, dude, you've been to too many pastor schools instead of reading your Bible. He made the comment on as because he made the comment on having a lot of people in his church, getting some people in the church, and. And I was happy for him. I was like, well, praise God. I was like, obviously we know numbers aren't a sign of, aren't, aren't a sign of success, aren't necessarily success, but it's a blessing if God gives you some people. He was like, well, it's kind of a way you tell success. And I didn't, think, I didn't say anything, but I was reading to Stephanie later on. I was like, well, man, if that's the case, Noah was one of the biggest failures in the entire Bible. He preached for how many years? And he saw eight people get saved. Jeremiah preached, wrote a whole book of the Bible, preached and preached, saw two converts. It's not about numbers. The world is about numbers. The world, and unfortunately, that seeps into Christians. It's like, well, it's, what, what can you see? Is it a great ministry? Is it, is it tons of people? Or is, that's not what God's interested in. God's interested in you doing what you can do. Amen. And so I'm just going to preach three very simple points. I'm going to just preach, are you doing what you can do to evangelize the sinner? Are you doing what you can do to edify the saints? Are you doing what you can do to, to exalt the Savior? I know it's basic, but trust me, we'll all spend the rest of our lives trying to do it. Yeah. The Bible says, in Ecle in, Bible says in Ecclesiastes 11, 1, I already quoted earlier, but the Bible says, Cast thy bread upon the waters, and thou shalt find it after many days. 
And Christian, what I want you to do is look back over your past week, past, past month, past day, whatever, and just on each of these three points, think back and think, Am I do, did I do what I could have done? Because I'm not a fool. I know good and well that some people are more naturally talented and gifted than others when it comes to some of these things. By na- I've got one brother-in-law who by nature is one of the most gifted soul winners I've ever seen in my life. He's the type who, I mean, his smile is bigger than my entire face. He can talk to anybody. He could strike up a conversation. And I used to get so jealous going soul winning with him because he could always lead people to the Lord, and I couldn't. I'd be waiting on him for like an hour after we were supposed to be back at the truck, and he'd come, he'd come dancing up and say how he led all these people to the Lord, and I'd just be happy for him, but I'd be super jealous. But the thing is, I'm not going to... I'm not going to stand in front of God and give account for the souls he led to the Lord. They were, they was what, it was what he could do. I'm going to stand in front of God and give account for the souls that I could have led to the Lord, the ones that I could have influenced, the seed I could have, sh- I could have sown. The Bible says in Psalm chapter 126, verse 5 and 6, the Bible says, He that goeth forth and weepeth, bearing precious seed, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. And you may not have the souls Dr. Upman had. You may not have the souls this missionary had. You may have the souls, but a Christian, are you doing what you could do? Now, I'm, now I know some people more naturally gifted, but typically the people who are do win people or the people who try. Most of the time, even the great soul winners who are real natural at it, they still get them because they try. Most people who have never led somebody to the Lord, you can say it's not, it's, well, I don't have the personality that may be. You can say, well, I don't have the ability that may be. But most of the time, it's due to just a lack of effort. It's due to a lack of desire. Most Christians, the reason they don't have any trophies, the reason they're not going to have anything to show for the Lord Jesus Christ, it's not going to be because they couldn't have had it. It's because they just didn't want it bad enough. They didn't care enough. Other things were more important. And Christian, that's an important thing. Now, obviously, the most important thing is to exalt the Lord Jesus Christ. We'll get into that in a minute. But Christian, when you get home to heaven, you want to have some people there with you. Well, you want to have some people waiting for you. I can't remember names. I can't remember faces. But I remember, I remember for years and years in Bible school, I remember I'd never let a single person to the Lord, and I would try and try and try. I'd go soul winning, and everybody else leads some of the Lord with me. I'd go pa- I'd try. I just remember one time being at my old brother Brian's house, and I remember I'm not a crier. I could practically count on one hand in the times I've cried. I'm getting soft now like I got a kid, but... <laughs> But especially then, I didn't cry over anything. And I remember being in his house just bawling because I was like, because like I've, I try and try and try to lead people, Lord, and I can't do it. And I was like, I've tried and tried and tried. And I remember Brian just trying to encourage me the best way he could. He was like, well, you just keep going. You just keep trying. And by the grace of God, that's what I kept doing. I still remember the first person I ever got to lead to the Lord. I remember I've never done drugs, but I swear there couldn't be a high any higher than that one. I remember wanting to... Fin- I remember when that guy was kneeling in the sand down there praying, asking Jesus Christ to save him. I remember as he's praying, I remember wanting to freeze time because I wanted to run up and down that beach screaming and shouting. I was so happy. And I, for sure, it made me want to go get some more. And Amen. I'm not the best. And I'm by no means the best soldier. I'm, and I don't do the best job, but I got some. And Christian, I wouldn't trade him for anything. Yeah. And, Chris, and what I want you to ask yourself is, are you doing what you can do? Do you could if you have more? I remember one time Nathan Bemis was preaching a blowout, and he asked who all, had, who all had passed out of track that day. And I remember there was hardly anybody who had, and I remember every single person from Kyle Stevens Church, there was like five or six of them had passed out of track that day, and it was impressive. It was a good testament to their church, a good testament to the kind of train they had. They were doing, they, they were doing what they could. They weren't necessarily the best. I don't know that they were all the best soars in the world, but they were sure doing what they could do. And if you would, you guys already call, quote it today, but look in your Bibles, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 12. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 12. And the Bible says in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 12, the Bible says, For the perfecting of the saints for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. And I'll say, secondly, Christian, you're doing what you could do to edify the body of Christ. Some of you may not be able to be soul winners. You may not be able to lead tons of people, Lord. But every single person in here can be doing something to, edif- to help out their brother, to edify their brother. The easy thing to naturally think is, well, that's Pastor Dominguez's job. Well, I mean, it's his job to get up there and preach. It's his job to feed the people. Yes, that's true. But you can do a lot more to edify people than just preach at them. 
Every single person, you'd be amazed how, how far some people would go if they just got a word of encouragement every once in a while. You'd be amazed at how far it'll go just by praying for somebody. There's, you may not be able, it's not too hard to, sit, to shake a brother's hand and say it's good to see you here. That's not very hard to do. Most people could do that. It's not very hard. It's not very hard to do just little things to try and edify somebody. And the thing is, everybody normally wants to be the, it's just natural in human nature lots of times to want to be the big shot, want to be in the spotlight. But most of the time, the people God, 90% of the work that's done is all from people in the background who are just doing what they could do to edify somebody. One of my favorite characters in the Bible is Paul. I love Paul. I love reading about him. But Paul was very, very, I want to say it, well, he all, but just by nature, Paul took the center of attention. He took the stage. And Paul, and God obviously very much used Paul, but in the background behind Paul, the one who got Paul going was a guy named Barnabas, a guy who was not showy, a guy who was not, who was never flashy, a guy who never took the center stage. It was always another guy. But what Paul, but what Barnabas was really, really good at is he was good at reaching down and helping a brother up. He was so good at that. When Paul was, when Paul was, an outcast when nobody wanted Paul, when nobody trusted him and said, we don't want that guy around here. Barnabas said, you know what, I think I see something in that guy. You know what, I think I'll help him out. And then a couple years later, after Paul's the big shot now, and Paul's in the spotlight, and Paul's preaching, then about the time they're trying to take another missions trip, Barnabas looks over and sees a guy named John Mark, and he says, you know what, Paul, I think we ought to help this guy over here. I think we need to try it. John's discouraged, he's down, but you know what, I think there's still something in that boy. I think we can pull him up, I think we can edify him, I think we can help him. And of course, Paul says, nothing doing. We're not having that guy. He's an idiot. He's a quitter. He's a failure. We're not having anything to do with him. And they split and they take off. And Paul, Paul keeps the center of attention. You don't read too much about Barnabas. But at the end of Paul's life, the very last book he writes, you find out that Paul acknowledges Barnabas was right. At the very end of his life, when Paul's writing to Timothy, he says, oh, by the way, you take Mark and you bring him with me, or bring him with you, because he's profitable for the ministry. You know what Paul said after how many years? He said, you know what, Barnabas, you were right. There was something in that boy. Yeah. And the thing was, is Paul wrote, Paul wrote most of the New Testament. Then Mark got to write a book. Barnabas never got to write a book. Barnabas was never the flashy one. He never was in the front. He was always in the back. But he just would help a brother out, and then lots of times they'd get the glory. I'll tell you one thing. One day... When you go up to heaven, I think, I think you're going to find that many times it's not the showy person. Not, and I'm not saying Paul being showy to, to be disregarded. But many times it's not the person who gets the spotlight that's going to get the credit. I believe one day when we get up to heaven, it's going to be the person in the background who was praying for the preacher. It's going to be the person in the background that was encouraging a person when they were about ready to quit. Because the thing is, it gets discouraging sometimes at trying to edify people because lots of times you don't see the good. Lots of times you don't get to see it. We won't see that till heaven. But you just never know what that little bit of edifying does. Right. Now, some, something I enjoy doing, I don't get to do it as much now with traveling, but I always enjoyed working out. I li I'm not very good at it, but I always enjoy bench press. I like going to a gym and all that stuff. But I remember Brother, Don I remember Brother Donovan giving an illustration one time about him going to a gym and bench pressing with a guy. I think the friend he was with was a bodybuilder. And so they're both benching, and then Brother Donovan decided he was going to see just how much weight he could do. And so they load a bunch up, and then he start, takes, he unracks it, takes it down, and then gets right about 90 degrees and just freezes. And he's straining and pushing. Anybody who's ever benched knows the feeling. And just wouldn't go up. And, of course, the obvious outcome is it's going to come back down. And it's going to come right in your chest. But all of a sudden, as he's straining, all of a sudden it goes up. And so he racked it and turned around and was like, so. He was like, did you help me? And the, and the friend was like, well, not really. I just stuck two fingers underneath there. And that was all it took. And Christian, the thing is, is lots of times you just don't know when. With some of those brothers and sisters in here, you don't know. Some of you just never know who's that close to falling, who's that close to quitting, what family's that close to breaking up, what kid's that close to going off in the world. And you just never know what just that little bit of that edifying will do. It might be just the thing that gets them over it. Just that word of encouragement to say, hey, brother, we're praying for you might be the thing that gets them over it. It might be the thing that keeps them coming to church. It might be those prayers for that brethren might be the thing that might be the one that finally got, got, them, to, got them to stick it out. Amen. I don't know this, but I've wondered before whether we're going to get up to heaven. And like I say, I don't know this, but I've wondered after about the time that all the silver and golds in the, all the 
silver and gold and the ashes are, and the ashes. When you look down at your life and it, your life goes into the fire, and of course for most people just comes out nothing but just ashes, maybe a trinket here or there in the ashes. And as you're just looking, as you're maybe holding just this tiny little, just these few trinkets here and there, I've wondered before whether Jesus Christ says, by the way, oh, Jesus Christ calls your side and they're like, oh, by the way, there's one more thing I want you to see. And he points over the side, and there's just this huge just pile of gold and jewels and just sparkling, just dazzling, just bright. And you say, what's that, Lord? And he says, oh, that's what you could have had if you had done what you could have. That's what you could have had. And he, and he starts going through some of those jewels, and he says, you see this one? you like, you remember family such and such? And you go, yeah, Lord, I do. And he says, if you'd have been praying for them like you were supposed to, they wouldn't have split up. And then he pulls out another and he says, you know, such and such, is, you know, such and such that quit coming to church years ago? He was like, and you say, yeah, Lord. And he says, this is the one if you'd have tried to encourage him instead of gossiping, that guy would have stuck it out and he would have been, and I was going to really use that guy. Let me tell you something, Christian, I bet it wouldn't take too, I don't know if God's going to do it or not, but I guarantee it wouldn't take too long before you just be weeping and crying, looking at what you could have done and wishing to God you could have gone back and done it a little bit better if you'd have done what you could have. And then lastly, I'm going to say, are you doing what you could do to exalt the Savior? Me and Pastor Mingus were talking some about this at, at supper. But you can do, you can do all, you can do, you can evangelize the sinner and you can edify the saints. You can do all these things and still not be exalting the Savior. You can do all sorts of works and not really be doing what you could have done. I'm sorry, sorry, wait, I'm going to use you for, I'm going to use you for an example. But about the time you really start, about, about the time you really start getting zealous for the Lord, about the time you really start wanting to do something for the Lord, the devil's very sly, he's very subtle. The devil, if you're really trying to serve the Lord, he's not going to come up and say, let's go get drunk. He's not going to say, come up and let's go to a bar. No, what he'll do is he'll get right beside you and say, man, you are really something, man. I mean, you've got, I mean, you're doing more to try and lead people to the Lord than anybody else. You're passed out more tracks, I bet, than that brother over there. I mean, you're, I mean, you got a prayer list that's way longer than that guy. And if you're not careful... I've seen that happen time and time and time again where you get a guy who is going to try to evangelize sinners, he is trying to edify the saints, and what it does, it starts going to their head, and they start thinking they're something special, and before long, they're not exalting the Savior, they're exalting themselves. I've seen that time and time and time again. It's a, it's a sad trend, and you just see it. I've seen it. I've seen it again and again and again where a guy will get saved, he'll get zealous, he'll start trying to lead people to the Lord, he'll start doing the all-night prayer meetings, he'll get zealous, do all these certain things, good things to do. But then the devil in the flesh starts sliding right up and says, well, man, you are something. And that's a danger. And it's a danger. That's a danger with anything. I found that even with preachers and even with missionaries, anything like that, it's real easy to start thinking, well, man, I'm really something. Man, I'm above this, or I got this. It's, it's, You've got to be very careful, Christian. There's many, there's many a preacher who's a better man than you that's fallen. There's, there's many a man that's gone where you've been and's gone, and been way better at than you that have fallen. And you can do all sorts of things. You can do all sorts of ministries. You can do all sorts of works. You can do all sorts of good things to do. And if you're not careful... You won't be exalting the Savior, you're going to be exalting yourself. And I believe there's going to be a whole lot of Christians that are going to get up to the judgment seat of Christ expecting that they're going to have some great reward, they're going to have some great thing, and they're going to get up there, and they're going to have their, you know, their whole soul winner's belt laid out. These are all the, this is my list of soul winners. They're going to have their check marks and how many times they read their Bible. They're going to have their prayer list, and they're going to have everything and say, well, Lord, I'm here. And God's going to say, what are you talking about? How, you already, Bible said in Matthew chapter 6, it says, yea, they have their reward. And I believe there's a lot of people that are going to get up there and Jesus Christ is going to say, what are you talking about? You got your reward down there. You spent your entire life, Christian life, bragging about what you did. You already got your reward, pal. Christian, that's not where I, I'm flesh, I'm human. I love getting a pat on the back. I love getting compliment. Anybody's flesh loves that. But Christian, that's not where I want it to come from. What I want to hear is one day hear, well done from Jesus. Yeah, I, I'd love to be... I'd love to be able to... I'd love to be able to lead tons of people, Lord. I'd love to be able to start tons of churches... I'd love to do all these great things, but what I want more than that is for Jesus Christ to say, well done one day. I want to be found faithful one day. I want to do what I can to evangelize, by the grace of God, do the very best I can to evangelize sinners, and you ought to want to do the same. I want to do the very best I can to edify the saints, but most importantly, Christian, you want to be exalting the Savior. The Bible says, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for Thou hast created all things, and for Thy pleasure they are and were created. 
The other two things aren't worth much one day if Jesus Christ isn't getting pleasure out of it, if he's not getting the glory out of it. One last place to turn, then I'm done. If you would, to look in your Bibles at Mark chapter 14. Mark chapter 14, verse 8. Now you all know the story. You all know the story of the woman breaking the alabaster box of ointment on Jesus. You all know, the, know, you all know this story very well. But verse 8, Jesus Christ gives one of the highest compliments you can give. It's one of the highest compliments he ever gives in the entire Bible. In Mark chapter 14 and verse 8. And the Bible says, She hath done what she could. She has come aforehand to anoint my body to the bearing. Verily I say unto you, Wheresoever this gospel shall be preached throughout the whole world, this also that she hath done shall be spoken of for memorial of her. Now Mary was a woman. She wasn't biblically allowed to preach. She wasn't, a, she wasn't allowed to do all these sort of things. But you know what? Jesus Christ didn't say that about Peter. He didn't say that about Thaddeus. He didn't say that about a ton of the other disciples. He didn't give that kind of compliment when he said she did what she could. That woman wasn't able to do a lot of the other things, but you know what she did? She did what she could. And God's God and Jesus Christ was so pleased, he said, you know what, she's going to get praise throughout the, the rest of... She's, she said he, she's always going to get praise for that just because she did what she could. It wasn't for leading a ton of people, Lord. It wasn't for doing anything other than just trying to do her very best she could to exalt the Savior. And that pleased Jesus Christ. Fanny Crosby was a, Fanny Crosby was a woman who was blind, got blind as a young kid. Blind her entire life. She, she couldn't preach. She couldn't even see somebody to pass out a track to. She couldn't see to do any of these ministries. But God let her write 8,000 hymns. And on her tombstone was the word, was that verse right there. She had done what she could. Amen. And you know, let me tell you something. That was all that was needed. Jesus Christ didn't need talent. He didn't need ability. He didn't need ministries. You know what he needs? He needs some people who do what they can. Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ doesn't need a bunch of doesn't need out of this church a bunch of missionaries necessarily. He doesn't need a bunch of preachers. He doesn't need even he doesn't need all this different stuff. You know what he wants? He wants some people who just do what they could, do what they can. Christian, when you want to get up, when you will get up the judgment seat of Christ, you don't need to build a temple like Solomon did. You know what you need to have done? Just did what you could, like David did. That's all you need to do. Just do what you can, Christian, until he comes. All right, Pastor Mings.